Hey everyone, welcome to the Babylon Bee Interview Show. I'm Kyle and this is not Adam Yenser. I'm Jarrett. This is Jarrett and we are today talking to Dr. Hugh Ross. Being a follower of Jesus Christ, you're joining a party that's way more fun than any non-theistic party mm -hmm. could ever think of. I'm not worried about super yeah, volcanoes. Well, I mean, they happen every 700,000 years. And the last time one happened was 700,000 years ago. Check out his new book, Designed to the Core. Let's welcome Dr. Ross. All right, well, thank you for coming in, Dr. Ross. It's great to meet you. We've met a lot of your colleagues already, and we kept saying we need to get the big cheese. All right. That's what they call you around <laughs> That's here. That's what they call you, yeah. yeah. Uh, they don't at our office. They, they got other names <laughs> Do for Do they me. have other names? The Grand Eagle. That's, <laughs> yeah. That's right. <laughs> well, it's great to have you. So how long have you been doing apologetics at this point? Well, probably since I gave my life to Christ, which was, gee. Uh, a few years ago. 1964. Yeah. Okay. So a few years ago. Oh, yeah. That was a good year. That was a good year. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I have, I'm a Gideon convert, so I studied a Gideon Bible for 18 okay. months. And I realized if I give my life to Christ... I have to commit to share what I've discovered with other people. So in that sense, apologetics was there right from the beginning. So you had that beginning. burden right from the beginning. Right. Yeah. How, how has the apologetics landscape changed since the 1960s till now? Do you find it's similar arguments, similar worldviews, or as the shifting? Well, the basics are similar. They've been similar for the past 2,000 mm -hmm. years. Uh, I think the biggest shift I've seen is that particularly in my discipline of astronomy and physics, is that the evidence uh, for uh, a causal agent beyond the universe creating matter, energy, space, and time is now so rigorous and compelling. What I'm seeing from my atheist peers is they, they appeal to things that we can't measure. So rather than trying to defend their atheism on what we can see and measure and test, they're appealing to things that can't be seen or tested. What's a good example of, of that? A good example is as they'll say, well, we can measure the characteristics of the universe back to when it was a 10 millionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second old, but we can't determine what's going on before that. So maybe before that, quantum mechanical space-time fluctuations might be so extremely large that they basically uh, will compete with uh, gravity for the dynamics of the universe. So maybe these space-time theorems uh, that are based on general relativity don't hold. And so they think maybe there's an escape hatch. But what's happening is that for the first time, we now can penetrate what's called that quantum gravity era. And the penetration basically sustains the space-time theorems. So the atheists are be being backed into a smaller and smaller corner of speculation. Mm. But I run into a lot of them and say, I'm not going to believe in your God until all possible speculations are eliminated. And I said, we humans will never know everything. I mean, I married my wife without absolute knowledge that she actually existed. I had high probabilities, <laughs> but I didn't have absolute proof. My wife is probably a thing too. I was thinking yeah. about it. You she think probably, so? She probably exists. Yeah. I thought that. Yeah. You too. We have something to talk to you about. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Well, hopefully the more you observe her, the more confident you become that she exists. <laughs> That's right. Pretty confident, yeah. And that's something I like to ask, ask apologists. You can make the most perfect argument, and someone might not necessarily believe. I, where, do you, where do you find that, um, that, these, that reasonable, lim reasonable arguments, arguments from logic, have their limits? Is it just the heart of the person that got other influences or doesn't? Or can you be convincing well, enough to convince I, everybody, you know? <laughs> What I tell people is there's no silver bullet. Yeah, every right. non-Christian is different from every other non-Christian. So you need to have a treasure chest of different apologetic tools. And don't throw at your tool right away. Ask questions. You need to find out who you're talking to, what are their issues are. And yet for some people, it's not intellectual at all. Uh, it's not, I mean, you can give them a, a huge amount of evidences in which you realize, you know, maybe there is a hurt. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I, I got to do a major debate at the uh, International Skeptic Society Conference at Caltech a few years ago, 750 atheists from around the world. And uh, afterwards, I said, you know, I've gotten a new apologetic argument this weekend. 
Because what I've observed is that the atheist scientists you invited, they all spoke very passionately about the non-existence of the God of the Bible. But they ignored all the other gods. It was just the God of the Bible they were focused on. <laughs> and they were passionate. And so if they were really convinced that the God of the Bible doesn't exist, mm -hmm. they'd be treating him like the Easter Bunny. Right. Uh, or like the Tooth Fairy. Their passion tells me they really do believe God exists, they just don't like him. Mm. And when the response I got from the atheists around me was, it's not that we hate the God of the Bible, it's that we despise his followers. And they all began to tell me stories uh, how they'd been wounded by an encounter they had with someone who claimed to be a Christian. And, you know, it's irrational. Why would you let a fallen human being get between you and a morally perfect God? Mm -hmm. But the problem is we are emotional beings. And it's hard for us to let go of our wounds and hurts. Mm. Yeah, I found any time that I had a friend that used to be a Christian and converted to atheism, it was almost never, well, I looked at the logical arguments and I realized that what made the most sense is that this all came from nothing. It was always, you know, something, and <clears throat> someone in the church hurt me, or how can a good God, which, I mean, which are questions that are legitimate, you know, they're, they're good questions to ask. How can a good God allow evil? Mm -hmm. The problem of evil is a big one. Yeah. It, it's always so emotionally driven. You know, not that there's anything wrong with our emotions or that that's not a legitimate objection, but yeah, I, I found it was rarely a logical objection. That yeah, on the other hand, what I've discovered is until you address their intellectual objections, mm. they're not going to trust you with sure. what's really going on in the heart. Mm. So you've got to, you know, gain their trust first. Uh, they have to realize that you've got integrity, that uh, you know, you're going to treat them with compassion, and then they'll tell you what the real reason is. Yeah, that's interesting. I've had experiences where I've used your your books and um, a couple of friends that have deconstructed, which then becomes deconversion, you know, like in, in a lot of our, like that's a lot of what's going on in our society. But I've had conversations with the folks and I'm like, every argument I come up against, it's like, well, this is really, really strong evidence that God does exist, that these things um, are true. And they will just continually go back to their other resources. And you can either like, track it to some kind of sin they want to continue in or so a lot of times it's that too if you find I find people just want to continue in the lifestyle that they want to continue in um, and they will try to come up with some intellectual argument to justify those things or um, it is an emotional hurt or something maybe it's a combination of both but um, have you run into that too or people are just like yeah especially with and Christians, often Christians. they say you Christians are so serious <clears throat> you don't have any fun uh, so it's like we need to reveal ourselves to them as real people that can enjoy life. And that, mm -hmm. hey, being a follower of Jesus Christ, you're joining a party that's way more fun than any non-theistic party mm -hmm. could ever think of. So it's important that they see us really having that sense of joy when we fellowship with one another. And I've run into that where I'll meet someone overseas, first time meeting, and non-Christians see we immediately have a bond. We immediately have a love for one another, and it gets them asking questions. Mm. You know, have you guys met? No, this is the first time we've met. Right. It's like, what's going on here? It's like the deep calling to the deep. Right. People accuse us of being too serious, I think. The, yeah, the we're very serious. Yeah. yeah, no jokes here. No jokes at the beat. No jokes. Yeah. Yeah. No jokes at the beat. <laughs> no. no jokes at the <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's where the Babylon Bee is making a major contribution. It's like, hey, if you can't laugh at yourself... Uh, you're taking life way too seriously. Yeah. And uh, so, and means you're really not open. Mm. So, we have an internal debate here at the office that's tearing <laughs> the office apart, and we okay. need to settle it. For. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> did the dinosaurs have feathers? Did the dinosaurs have feathers? They may have. That's an unanswered question. Okay. So, mm. it's still being engaged. Do they have feathers? I mean, look at birds and dinosaurs, they both have scales, fish have scales. And uh, it's not the biggest step to go from scales to feathers. So it's like, and there is evidence out there that the dinosaurs may have had feathers. Right now, it's not compelling. It's so good. I think you're going to have to continue this little this dialogue. This debate. Yeah. 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 Well, it seemed like when Jurassic Park came out, they made this. Have you seen Jurassic Park? Oh, yeah. <coughs> Great movie, right? Did you uh, like Jurassic Park? As long Park? as you can ignore the laws of well, physics. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what I'm interested in. I want to hear more about that. Well, so T-Rex can't run that fast. Yeah. Okay. How fast would a T-Rex run? Well, a T-Rex could conceivably run that fast, uh, but any slight trip, 
it would do itself serious injury. Like a toddler, because it's top heavy. Well, it, well doesn't, it doesn't have the arms. Yeah, but like that's what toddlers, they have yeah. the big head <laughs> and they run and they just topple. Oh, that's, that's true. Well, I mean, just take us human beings. The taller you are, the more likely you are to damage your body when you fall. Mm. And so if you've got a creature that tall and that heavy, uh, it's going to quickly learn, hey, I better not go too fast, because if I go too fast, I'm going to trip and fall. Or I mean, just like us. There's a difference between your probability of tripping and hurting yourself when you're walking compared to where you're running. If you're running fast, you hit a little rock, you could spin over and do yourself some harm. Yeah. And so that T-Rex is not going to be chasing a Jeep at 45 miles an hour. It's <laughs> good to know. <laughs> well, the other thing that bugged me is that they were so relentless about trying to eat the humans. Like there was other dinosaurs to eat. There were probably better sources of meat. And they were just like stalking one person all the way across the island. Yeah. Your thoughts? <laughs> well, I did think that where they showed that scene of this very overweight lawyer uh, being yeah. eaten. I says, well, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's a lot of calories Mostly there. Mostly because he was a lawyer, yeah. <laughs> Uh, high calorie, but you know, yeah. if, you, if you watch sharks, they, when they grab a human being, they typically spit it out right away. Why? We don't have enough fat in our bodies for them to spend the energy uh, to kill us and uh, consume us. Makes that's sense. Good. Man, that makes me uh, look at Jurassic Park in a whole new way. Yeah. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> do, you, uh, do you believe in aliens? Well, I do believe in what I think you're talking about, extraterrestrial aliens, because the Bible speaks about them. They're called angels. But the big difference is, unlike us, they're not subject to the laws of physics or the space-time dimensions. Right. And so, do I believe that there's aliens like us that are subject to the uh, space-time dimensions and the laws of physics? From a biblical perspective, it's wide open. You know, God could have created whatever he wants anywhere else he wants. Mm -hmm. The Bible doesn't really put much in the way of restrictions on it. So little green men show up in a saucer that doesn't debunk the Bible or something. Doesn't debunk the Bible, but it would disturb the astrophysicists. Right. Because everywhere we look in the universe, we see conditions that are hostile for advanced life except planet Earth. I mean, I just got a book coming out called Design to the Core, where I make the point tens of thousands of super galaxy clusters, but ours is the only one that has a structure that makes possible advanced life. And, you know, we're in the local group within that super galaxy cluster. It's the only local grouping of galaxies we have found mm. that has the conditions that make advanced life possible. And the argument goes all the way down. Mm. Uh, we're living in the only region in our Milky Way galaxy. We're living in the only bubble within our galaxy. Uh, we're living in the only fluff in our galaxy mm. where advanced life is possible. And we astronomers have been scouring our galaxy for over 60 years, trying to find a star that's sufficiently like our star to the sun, that it could be a candidate to have a planet orbiting it in which advanced life is possible. Hmm. We found lots of stars that are twins of one another, but no adequate twin of the sun. And uh, likewise, we now know that for advanced life to be possible on the planet, it must be accompanied by a moon, just like our moon. You need a planet, just like our planet Earth, a moon just like our moon, and at the form as a result of two planets merging together so that you get a hot enough core in both the moon and the Earth. And uh, then you need the two bodies initially very close together so that the tidal forces they exert in one another circulate the liquid iron inside the cores of both bodies. So both bodies have a magnetosphere and need to be close enough that the magnetosphere couples. If you don't have an early coupled magnetosphere, the radiation from the host star, the particle radiation, will sputter away all the planet's water, all the planet's atmosphere. Hmm. So that's the latest habitability requirement for a planet. Uh, it has to have a relatively uh, small rocky planet orbited by a really big uh, rocky moon that has a hot origin as a result of a merger event uh, where they're close enough together, you get that tidal interaction, and where they're orbiting a star, where the particle radiation will only be a problem for the first half billion years. So we so we live in that. We live in that, saying. but the probability of finding another one like that <laughs> without divine intervention is utterly remote. 
So on yeah. that basis, yeah. unless God intervenes somewhere else, we are alone. We're alone in the universe. With an early coupled magnetosphere. And a, coupled mag a magnetosphere is my favorite. That broke on my car. The other yeah. Day. <laughs> yeah. Had to go right. get that the fixed. The flux capacitor It doesn't broke. rule out microbes, but it does rule out people like us. Yeah. Or okay. beings like us. Advanced life is what you're yeah. saying. Advanced carbon-based life. Right. Okay. That's really interesting. So what about people that say that they've been abducted by aliens? There's like thousands of people mm. that claim it. Mm. Well, uh, I don't know whether you've interviewed Ken Samples, but he and I co-authored a book, Lights in the Sky and Little Green Men, mm -hmm. where I talked about my experience processing UFO reports. Uh, and you say, how did I get that job? I was an amateur astronomer before I became a professional astronomer. So at every institution where I worked as an astronomer, they said, you handle the UFO reports. You know the night sky. So I wrote those chapters, but uh, Ken is a cult expert. So uh, he wrote the chapters on uh, UFO religions and people who claim to have been abducted. And I agree, I've run into people who claim to be abducted too in my uh, processing of these UFO reports. Mm. I don't doubt their experience, mm. but I don't think they had a physical encounter. Mm. It was more of a spiritual encounter. Uh, so think of it as uh, some kind of vision they experience. Mm. And they'll claim that they've been touched, that they've been injured. And, uh, but, when you, but when you look on their body, groped, yeah, yeah, you can't find any evidence on their body of what they claim. So, but again, uh, unlike uh, one of the professors I had, Carl Sagan, who said, none of this is real. Well, from his worldview perspective, he didn't believe in non-physical reality. Yeah. I do. I believe God created spiritual beings that are non-physical. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we document in Lights in the Sky and Little Green Men that's what's behind what we call the residual UFOs. The UFOs that do not have a natural explanation, explanation as military activity or a hoax. And that's about 1% of everything that people report as UFOs. Mm. And did, our, you, did you see the Area 51 stuff that they released recently? Do you have any opinions, any comments on that? Well, I've seen what our government, they're gonna be releasing more too, because. Mm. We're talking tens of millions of UFO encounters in the nations around the world. So this is a huge database. But what they've released is no different than what we reported on in our book uh, almost 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. It's just more of the same. And uh, one reason I'm convinced <coughs> this UFO phenomena is real is when you look at the residual cases, there's clear evidence that it is real but simultaneously there's evidence that it's not physical. So for example, there's about 2,000 cases where observers see a UFO going through the atmosphere and it crashes into the earth. You go to the crash site, you can see a crater. You can see damaged vegetation. If there's snow, the snow is melted. But when you go to the crash site, there's no debris, there's no artifacts. We all know the physical craft crashes into the earth you're gonna recover artifacts and debris. Right. In this case, there's nothing. Moreover, when the observers see it going through the atmosphere at 15,000 miles per hour, no sonic boom mm. and no heat friction. I mean, if you ever watch the shuttle go through the atmosphere, you see this bright glow uh, behind it because right. of all the heat uh, that is generated by going through the atmosphere. With UFOs, <coughs> no heat friction, no sonic boom, yeah. But the fact that you got a crater with damaged vegetation tells you something real was going on, but it's not physical. So if it was a carbon-based life, which is what you know, I guess people are contending that it would be something that's physical, carbon-based. If you're going 15,000 miles per hour in an atmosphere and you're changing directions all over the place, would it just kill you? It would yeah, just, it would kill yeah. you. I mean, that's the other thing you see with these UFOs. They make sharp right angle turns yeah. at five to 15,000 miles per hour. Uh, no carbon-based life form can survive that kind of acceleration. Uh, an angel could. <laughs> an angel could. Yes. They're interdimensional. So are you saying they're demons? Is that what you're arguing? Well, Fallen angels. I think, I, I take that conclusion because when you look at what are called the close encounters of the first, second, third, and fourth kind, mm -hmm. the experiences are always deleterious. The best you're going to come away with when you have a close encounter with a residual UFO is recurring terrifying nightmares. 
say, what's the worst case scenario? People have been killed by the encounters. Mm. Uh, sometimes their animals are killed by the encounters. So it's not a pleasant experience. But what we document in our book, if you're having these kinds of experiences, if you close the doors to all the occult in your life, that'll be the end of your UFO experiences. Mm. And if you open those doors, don't be surprised if this stuff starts to happen. Because yeah. often what happens is people have these close encounters, it's repeated encounters. Mm -hmm. Is and it kind of like hypnagogic hallucinations or like night ex terrors? And yeah, exactly. Is it kind of similar, similar to all that? Similar to all that. Yeah. And there's cases where people claim that they were put into a trance by these beings. Mm -hmm. And even where they're on a, a computer and they begin to, you know, they're totally in a trance. Uh, but it's called automatic writing. Uh, where this right. uh, spirit being takes control of a human and writes out what the spirit being, namely the fallen angel, mm -hmm. wants him to write. Uh, the most famous example of that is the Orontia book, which is kind of a Bible for four different UFO religions. And it's almost 4,000 pages long. A third of its content is denying the deity of Jesus Christ. Hmm. Interesting. But, so I thought I'd give you an idea of the source. Yeah, like why it's a... Yeah, why so focused on denying what, the deity of Jesus Christ? Isn't that what Joseph Smith said happened to him too? Isn't he kind of like... Well... Uh, <laughs> There's nothing to talk yeah. about that. <laughs> well, I've been on some uh, Muslim podcasts and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's interesting. And I, I studied uh, Islam and uh, Mormonism before I became a Christian. I looked at all the different world religions. But I noticed an eerie similarity between Islam and Mormonism. They both are founded on the Old New Testament. So in both religions, there's an exhortation, hey, these are spiritual books you need to study. But they have a latter-day revelation. So there's an, an extra book or books. In, in case of Islam, you got the Quran. In the case of Mormonism, they got uh, three books. And notice that both Joseph Smith and uh, Muhammad claim that they were visited by this angelic being. Uh, that gave them these scriptures. Mm -hmm. I don't doubt that. Yeah. Uh, but it tells us in the uh, epistle of 1 John, be wary when an angel approaches you, appearing as an angel of light. Mm -hmm. So in my opinion, uh, both Joseph Smith and Muhammad had an angelic visitation, and I believe it's the same angel. Wow. So you said... And that explains to me just how incredibly similar the doctrines are. Yeah. I mean, the doctrine of women is eerily similar. The right. doctrine of heaven is eerily similar. Right. So, yeah. so you said uh, Carl Sagan was your professor. I had him for a week in, in a, a week. summer uh, <laughs> in a course at the University of Toronto. Mm. That's what I loved about my graduate career there. Every summer they would bring in four world-renowned astrophysicists. Each of them would teach a short course. But to me, the highlight is having dinner with the four or just sitting around watching the four debate one another. So do so you have any cool stories about Carl Sagan? Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, he was supposed to give a, a, a course on the formation of planets, and he did talk about that. But uh, he also talked about extraterrestrial intelligent life. And I remember one of the lectures he gave, he said, you know, we humans are in real trouble. We're going to exterminate ourselves. Our only hope is that we make contact with an extraterrestrial civilization, more intelligent than us, that has solved our problems. And for sure, they've communicated an Encyclopedia Galactica. If we can just tune our radio telescopes to read that Encyclopedia Galactica, uh, it will solve all of our human problems. Mm. I was sitting in the second row. And I was saying to my fellow graduate students, don't we already have an Encyclopedia Galactica? And maybe Carl just needs to read that. Mm. And Carl overheard me. He says, I know exactly what you're talking about. No one can live up to the moral standards of that book. So forget it. And it's like, that's the whole point of the book. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. Wow. So, uh, and my colleague uh, at our office uh, Dave Rogstad, he knew Carl better than I did. And uh, when Carl got the diagnosis of cancer, he contacted Carl and said, 
hey, uh, I've known you, uh, you know, you only got two years to live. What about if I give you the exam of questions ahead of time that you might have to answer when you die? Hmm. And Carl said, this will be fun. And so they had a two year back and forth email uh, correspondence and the last six months of Carl's life, uh, Dave asked Carl, uh, do we have your permission to pray for you? There's a number of Christians I know that would like to pray for you. And he said, by all means. Mm. So where Carl wound up at the end of his life, I really don't know. That's a great story. So Neil deGrasse Tyson recently tweeted, lunar eclipses are so unspectacular that if nobody told you what was happening to the moon, to the moon you'd probably not notice at all. Just saying. Agree or disagree? <laughs> no, I would disagree because... <laughs> Come on. I mean, if you go back even thousands of years, uh, people just with their naked eye were looking at these lunar eclipses and say, wow, isn't it interesting that the shadow we see on the moon uh, is uh, got curvature to it? It looks like some kind of spherical body is blocking out the light. Maybe that's our planet. And so that's when they began to say, well, you know, that makes sense. Because uh, when we travel south, we see different stellar constellations than we do in the north. And that would only be the case if the Earth was a sphere. And they said about measuring the sphericity of the Earth by looking at the uh, shadow of an obelisk at one point, mm -hmm. uh, latitude at another point. They actually measured the uh, circumference or the diameter of the Earth to 1% precision, which is not bad for people without telescopes. Maybe. Then they looked at that shadow of the lunar eclipse on the moon and uh, also examined the shadows of what happens when you get a solar eclipse. And by that means, they determine the size of the moon, the distance of the sun. They determine the size of the sun and the moon and the distances to both bodies and figured out that, hey, the Earth must be orbiting around the sun. So heliocentrism goes back thousands of years. Mm -hmm. The reason why people think, oh, well, nobody believed in that until Copernicus, they couldn't predict the future positions of planets given the math that they had at that time. They didn't have algebra. So as Ptolemy has said, well, if we do it from an Earth-centered perspective, we can make the math work and we can predict the future positions of planets. Mm -hmm. uh, once they had algebra, they no longer needed to do that. And, uh, you know, people credit Copernicus what Copernicus did is he left his uh, home of Poland, went down to Italy, and uh, went through the major libraries there and discovered what the ancient astronomers had uh, determined thousands of years earlier. They were heliocentrists, so Copernicus just basically copied what they had come up with. And uh, these days we give Copernicus the credit, but it really dates back much earlier. Yeah. <laughs> it's like but it a, makes a point. Hey. Yeah. Uh, these lunar eclipses, and by the way, I don't know if you saw the lunar eclipse of a couple of yeah. nights ago. Yeah. Uh, I was impressed with just of how dark. Uh, so it tells me the fires that are going on on Earth, the, the pollution we see. Uh, so the sunlight that was being uh, bent by the atmosphere of the Earth, it's the darkest total lunar eclipse I've ever seen. Because mm. usually you get kind of a nice bright red color. And... Uh, at least here in the L.A. Basin, it didn't come out that way. Boy. So that kind of gives you some insight what's going on in our atmosphere. Wow. But where I would agree with uh, what I think Tyson would say is solar eclipses are much more spectacular than lunar eclipses. So They're yeah. way cooler. So in, uh, in Star Trek, they, re they reach light speed by going through warp, which I don't quite understand. In Star Wars, they do hyperspace. And then in some fictional universes, they yeah. do... In Dune, they do space folding. Is yep. light speed possible? Piece of paper. Which of these uh, fictional works gets the closest to how it might work? Well, a friend of mine who's the chairman of the physics department at Baylor University, uh, Gerald Cleaver, uh, he and a couple of his colleagues said, let's actually figure out what it would take to go faster than the velocity of light in a spaceship. And he said, yeah. Nothing physical can go faster than the velocity of light unless you bend the space-time fabric of the universe. Because the general relativity does not put a limit on how fast the space fabric of the universe can expand. And in the future, it will expand faster than the velocity of light. But to do it locally, you have to expend a lot of energy. So he published a paper 
uh, basically pointing out, in order to bend the space-time fabric in front of your spaceship so that you can actually travel faster than the velocity of light, you would need to convert the mass of Jupiter into pure energy every second. And he the, concluded the paper by saying the chances of that being funded any time in the near future are relatively yeah. remote. That seems hard. <laughs> I was going to say that seems yeah. really hard to do. Yeah. So the Millennium Falcon would need that much energy? Would need that much energy every second. Every Coming up next, for Babylon Bee subscribers. This is our one chance to get detailed information on a planet outside of our solar system. I remember watching the Martian movie with my two sons, and I said, Matt Damon cannot run like that on Mars. Yeah, are you annoying to watch movies with? <laughs> yeah. Well, those kinds of, I, mean, I, I can handle science fiction movies where they only violate the laws of physics at a rate of about one a minute. This has been another edition of the Bee Weekly from the dedicated team of certified fake news journalists you can trust here at the Babylon Bee. Reminding you that someone out there knows something about Carmen. And we're going to find them. <laughs>